Good evening. Can you, can you guys hear me? My name is Victoria Chrisman, and I am the director of the Center for Ethics and Public Engagement. Thank you all for coming out in the middle of a <laughs> almost tornado or whatever it was that just happened here. This is a great turnout for our first event of the year, which makes me think either we need to focus on sport more often or maybe just put Dave Mitchell's name on everything that we do. <laughs> but I'm glad that you guys could make it. My job here tonight is brief. I have two things to do. The first is to, is to introduce Coach, and the second is to invite you all to a reception after this event, which will be just across the hall in Quali Lounge. There's food, so please come and don't leave till it's all gone. So Dave Mitchell is entering his 25th year as coach and instructor of mathematics here at Luther College. <laughs> That is so not the most impressive thing that I'm going to tell you. <laughs> the other, the other Im impressive things are he's coached nine double N double NCAA champions and 57 All-Americans. He is five times Conference Coach of the Year and once National Division III Wrestling Coach of the Year. But the thing I find most impressive is that he is married to Bridget and has four children, three of whom? Uh, two are Luther grads, one's a current student, and we might get the fourth one next year. Awesome. <laughs> one of them survived my paideia class. And Bridget teaches a water aerobics class to older ladies. Are you Bridget? My mom is in your class, and she <laughs> loves it. <laughs> and anyone who can teach my mom anything has my utmost respect. <laughs> So please join me in welcoming Dave, who will then introduce the rest of our speakers. Welcome. <laughs> the clapping for the 25 years must mean you're as surprised as I am that I've made it that long. That's good. Excited to be here, and uh, like uh, they talked about earlier, I mean, the tornado, I didn't know what this would end up being. We're going to have to show a lot of resilience just to get here. But I'm excited to have a great group of panelists that are going to join us in just a few minutes, uh, and excited to talk about a topic I'm very passionate about. Growing up as the youngest of eight children on a farm in rural Iowa, I've been surrounded by resilient people my entire life. My family, friends, teachers, coaches, teammates, and colleagues have been outstanding role models of resilience for me. My mother passed away when I was eight years old, and my father and older siblings, a lot of them are here right now tonight, in fact, could have been textbook, textbook illustrations of resilience throughout that hardship. Where I grew up, in a farm near Riceville, these gloves were a symbol of hard work and perseverance. I don't mean to suggest that rural America is the only place resilience is developed, but I point to it as an example near us here in Decorah. But rural America, correction, all of America is changing. And these gloves and any other symbols we use as a symbol of resilience don't quite represent the same thing they did a few decades ago. It's well documented that there's a decline in resilience amongst college students. Some have even typecast millennials as the snowflake generation because of the lack of resilience. But it isn't just millennials. A 2017 global report also found there's a decline of employee resilience in the workplace, resulting in absenteeism, not showing up to work, and presenteeism, showing up and not being engaged, that's costing the economy billions of dollars. So this decline in resilience is widespread and not isolated to a single age group. Moreover, resilience is a virtue as old as human existence. For thousands of years, people have been trying to think and learn about how to be more resilient. We've been trying to make ourselves, our families, our companies, our teams, our colleges, our communities stronger as we face challenges and hardship. That's why I'm so excited and proud that Luther College and the Center for Ethics and Public Engagement have chosen to address resilience as a topic not only tonight but throughout the year. Because here's the good news. Resilience is a skill that can be developed. According to the American Psychological Association, resilience is not a trait that people either have or don't have that we're either born with or not born with. No, it involves behaviors, thoughts, and actions that anyone can learn and develop. There are strategies to develop resilience that all can practice and incorporate into their lives. While some might be more or less resilient based on genetics and the environment they were raised in, all of us can grow in our ability to be more resi resilient with training. That is great news. 
Tonight, I'm going to outline how structured athletics is a great place to foster that development of resilience. And with some help of some outstanding panelists who will come and join me here in just a bit, I'll examine some inherent and systematic ways sport helps participants develop resilience. Well, again, I don't mean to suggest athletics is the only place resilience can be developed. I do help to make the argument to suggest that athletics can play a very important role in developing resilience in youth moving forward. The best part is the resilience growing strategies that athletes adopt don't apply only to the athletic field, but are transferable to all facets of life. And they can be imitated by non-athletes in non-athletic settings as well. A study by Fletcher and Sarker in 2012 concluded that an athlete's ability to overcome and readjust in stressful situations can be applied to athletic competitions, organizational events, and personal issues. That is, the study concluded that resilient skills that athletes develop are transferable skills that can help in the workplace, cultural settings, and in personal life. Throughout the talk tonight, I hope you gain an appreciation for the important role that athletics can play in developing resilient skills and maybe even take home an idea or two to incorporate into your own lives. First, we better get a, a kind of a, a good definition of what we mean by resilience. The Oxford English Dictionary defines resilience as the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties, toughness. While the Webster Dictionary defines resilience as the ability to recover from or adjust easily to misfortune or change. What I don't like about those definitions is that they suggest being resilient means that you recover back to the state that you were before the difficulty or misfortune was experienced. I don't believe that. I think when we face serious adversity, it has the potential to change us. How it changes us is up to us. So I like to think of resilience as putting our shoulder into challenges and coming out the other side changed. Hopefully coming out the other side. I like this quote by Eric Greitens. It says, if you're growing, you are likely failing. If you are not failing, you're likely not growing. I think Albert Einstein stated something similar when he stated, there's only one road to true human greatness, and it's the road through suffering. So if we agree that experiencing some amount of hardship is the path to greatness, and if we agree that resilience is the locomotive that carries us through the hardship to the greatness, and if we agree that, in fact, resilience can be developed, then how can we develop it in today's world of declining resilience? This is where I think organized sport can play a very important role. In fact, the role athletics can play in helping youth develop resilience may be more important now than it ever has been in the modern era. Organized sport has many built-in stressors that require athletes to regularly face adversity. These stressors cannot be completely avoided. And so athletes, by choosing to be athletes, are choosing to face these inevitable challenges on a regular basis. Athletes have to find ways to cope with fatigue, injury, defeat, uncertainty, maybe even coaching. <laughs> Thus, they must learn to cope with and battle through these stressors, and it really is the athlete and only the athlete that can cope with these stressors. In a minute, we're going to look at some systematic ways that coaches and programs try to help athletes develop skills to cope with these adverse situations. But ultimately, the athlete must develop these skills and do it themselves. Thus, just by choosing to be athletes, regardless of their coaching or teaching, they are growing in their ability to work through adverse situations. They are taking ownership and battling through uncertainty and hardship which are two of the qualities at the core of resilience. There are many ways that coaches and athletic programs intentionally and systematically help their athletes develop the thoughts, behaviors, and actions necessary to be resilient. I'm gonna list a few of them here and uh, share some ways we incorporate them into our wrestling program at Luther, and then I'm gonna invite our panelists to come up and share some of their ideas, and I'm as excited as you are to hear their responses on some of them. So here are some ways that coaches systematically work to develop resilience in their athletes. They teach their athletes how to set lofty but achievable goals. They help athletes establish healthy life habits and strong work ethic as a means to accomplish their goals and have consistent performances. They encourage their athletes to focus only on what they can control and let go of the things that they cannot. They coach their athletes to see themselves as the captain of their own ship, to see that they are responsible for their actions, their performance, and really, long-term, their own happiness. They help athletes put loss in perspective and to have a growth mindset from those setbacks. They teach mental imagery methods and help their athletes develop positive self-talk as a means to control emotions and grow their confidence and optimism. 
and they help their athletes identify their strengths and weaknesses and develop a strategic plan to help them work on their weaknesses while really focusing on building around their strengths. But take a look at this list. Although all these things are taught in the context of an athletic performance, if you removed the first few words of these, I think you'd agree that this is a great list of things that we could all incorporate in our lives to be more resilient. As I mentioned earlier, research has shown that these strategies learned in athletic context are transferable skills to all the other facets of life. Let me share a few thoughts on a few of these items and how we incorporate, and incorporate them into our wrestling program. And like, then, like I mentioned, I'll invite our panelists to join me up here on the stage. While all athletes are striving towards winning in their sport, good coaches and mature athletes know that winning is just a byproduct of a system, a process that leads to greatness in much more than just sport. Where that process starts is in establishing a set of goals and then developing the habits necessary to achieve those goals. Legendary coach John Wooden never talked about winning. He talked about developing into the best you are capable of becoming. And winning, a lot of winning, followed for him. An article in Psychology Today by Dr. Rob Whitley states, setting and meeting of goals facilitates the development of resilience. This helps develop willpower, as well as the ability to create and execute an action plan. Coaches and athletes know well that by setting goals and developing a plan to achieve them, they are embarking on a journey that is closely tied to those goals. Former NCAA football coach Urban Meyer states, if your habits are not in alignment with your dreams and goals, you have two choices. You either lower your dreams and goals or you elevate your habits. So establishing goals then is closely connected with establishing quality habits and in the long run, developing resilience. A few years ago, I had the opportunity to hear Joe Golly speak at the National Wrestling Coaches Convention. It really stuck with me. Joe's a former wrestler and the CEO of TTI Corporation that has companies such as Dirt Devil, uh, Milwaukee Power Tools, Ryobi. And uh, Joe talked about some ideas in terms of setting goals. And he suggested that we set three to five goals, both personally and professionally, to work on every 12 to 18 months. He states that three are better than five because you're more likely to accomplish them. And if he says you have more than five, you really have none because you're not going to be able to put the attention towards them to be able to, to accomplish them. Joe says this means that some things will have to fall to the wayside as you focus on those three to five things, and that's okay. What I really liked about what he said, though, is that he suggests that we look back and give ourselves credit for what we've done. He states that every six months we should look back and identify something significant that we've accomplished in our life. I really like that mindset. Anytime we're setting goals, we need to first of all do a self-assessment of where we are and what our individual strengths and weaknesses are. In our Luther Wrestling program, we ask our guys to self-assess what makes them great as a wrestler, what positions and what skills make them great, and then similarly, what are two or three things that are holding them back from beating the best guys in the country. Our entire focus the second half of our season is to build off of those strengths and to work on improving and hiding those weaknesses. We develop a very specific plan to address each person's weaknesses strategically. More importantly, though, is that we emphasize on getting to our strengths, get to where we're good at over and over again in matches. That helps us hide those weaknesses. That is, we focus on our strengths as a way to minimize our weaknesses. Even though we're competing against an opponent, wrestling has so little to do with what our opponent is doing. It's so much more about getting to where we're good at over and over again, regardless of what our opponent's doing. Obviously, we're aware of strengths of our opponents, but we really approach each match focused more on what our strengths are than worrying about theirs. And at the end of the season, when we're trying to reach peak performance, I have each one of our coaches communicating a common list of strengths for each of our starters each day. By personally hearing the strengths over and over again, our wrestlers, hopefully, are building confidence and adding that messaging to their own self-talk. I think good coaches encourage their athletes to identify and build on their strengths. That's a great way to find the core of what can make us great, regardless of the situation we encounter. By focusing on our strengths, we are adding to the arsenal that we can use in our positive self-talk, which ultimately adds to our confidence and optimism. But any time we set lofty goals and are passionate about accomplishing them, we almost certainly are going to face roadblocks along the way. Each of the nine NCAA champions and the 57 All-Americans I have coached at Luther had to develop 
into a position where they could achieve those things. They had plenty of setbacks along the way. In fact, two of the NCAA champions I coached only won one tournament their entire college career. The NCAA tournament, the last tournament they ever wrestled in in their college career. Think about that. They had been beat by someone in every tournament they had ever wrestled in during their college career, all the way to the very last college tournament. And yet somehow, they thought they could still win it. And they did. They overcame obstacles, self-doubts, and they made it happen. As I mentioned earlier, I'm the youngest of eight children, and uh, my oldest brother Jim was Riceville's first state champion, and he has the same story. He never won a tournament until the state tournament his senior year in a place that it had never been done. So we're always going to have these, ro these roadblocks that, that, that come into play. The key, key is, how do we respond to those setbacks and those roadblocks? I like this picture. When we set lofty goals and work hard towards them, we're going to have setbacks. I think it's human nature for us to have a first reaction of disappointment and frustration. Then what? Do we let those setbacks keep us down, or do we put our shoulder into them and come out the other side? And I think it's the then what that separates champions from others. It separates those who develop at a faster rate than those that don't. It separates those who are going to grow from those setbacks and those that aren't. Those that ultimately reach their goals and those that don't. And I believe coaches do an excellent job of helping athletes frame a resilient response to the question, then what? The last thing I want to quickly touch on before we invite our panelists to come up and, and ask them a lot of great questions um, is uh, envisioning setbacks before they occur. I read a great book a few years ago recommended to me. Sorry, I think I'm on. Sorry about that. Sorry. Here we go. Sorry. First of all, Dan Gable. Sorry. Dan Gable, longtime wrestling coach at the University of Iowa, says that when you face setbacks and defeat, take the lesson from the experience commit it to memory, and move forward with the positive. I think the ability to dissect what went wrong and quickly refocus on what needs to be done moving forward is a key trait of successful people. For a long time, I struggled with the moving forward with the positive part of what Gable states, but I realize now there's always some positive in every situation we face. Furthermore, psychologists have identified that optimism helps blunt the impact of stress on the mind and body in the wake of disturbing experiences. I talk with our guys about this all the time, that it's okay to be upset with a loss and being driven to improve moving forward, but don't get down and let it slow your develop development by beating yourself up for an extended period of time. Learn from the experience, commit the lesson to memory, and move forward with the positive. I think that's a great lesson to live by. Now, Ron, the last thing I want to touch base is kind of envisioning those setbacks before they occur. And I read a great book a few years ago that was recommended to me by Ann Mansfield, and the name of the book was Resilience. It was written by a Navy SEAL trying to help a, a fellow Navy SEAL work his way through some adversity. And in the book, the author states, the naive mind imagines effortless, effortless success. The cowardly mind imagines hardship and freezes. But the resilient mind imagines hardship and prepares. I like this mindset when setting and approaching lofty goals. Of course, there are going to be things that go wrong. There are going to be obstacles in our life. We need to expect those and not let them distract us from where we plan to go. Envision things are going to go wrong. We talk, that, we talk about that with our guys in our program. Envision officials making bad calls. Believe it or not, they do. Envision feeling fatigued. It's going to happen. Amongst all of that, see yourself coming through on top. Envision the worst. Prepare yourself for it and see yourself coming through successful. The author of the book, Resilience, summarizes this with the simple statement. Envision yourself as strong, remind yourself you're strong, become strong. I love that. I'm gonna invite our uh, panelists to come up here and I'm ask them a few questions and then we'll wrap it up afterwards. So if we can get these six panelists to come forward, please, that'd be great. Let's give them a round of applause, shall we? First of all, I've got great respect for all of these folks, which is why I invited them to join me today. And they've all got unique perspectives and unique uh, things to add to the discussion, I think, tonight. And, and I think we'll just kind of go right down the line. And um, there's a microphone on each side we can pass down. And I think I'll introduce them as we start, and then I'll ask them a question. 
Uh, at the end, if we have time left over, which hopefully we should, we'll uh, allow them to offer any other things that they might want to share and then allow the audience to ask any questions that they might have. But I'm going to start at the far end. Very excited to have Dr. Paul Merrick back here with us uh, here tonight. Paul wrestled for me here at Luther College. He's from Turkey Valley High School originally. And uh, Paul was very driven in his time at Luther and uh, had plenty of setbacks that he had to work through. So Paul, as a sophomore, was our starting wrestler at 174 pounds. And a week before the conference tournament, he was seated second uh, in the conference and would have qualified for the NCAA tournament had he finished in the top three at the conference tournament. He was seated second. But the week before, he tore his ACL and wasn't able to compete at the conference tournament. We had a backup that stepped in, and he qualified for the NCAA tournament, just to further kind of you know, give an example of how tough Paul was. And then he came back in his uh, third year, still recovering from the ACL. His fourth year, in his first dual meet match of the year, he tears the ACL. Was it the same leg? The other knee, okay, in his fourth year. Unbelievable. How many of us would have just said it's not meant to be, right? I mean, how many of us say that? Well, it's just not meant to be. We would have just given up. But Paul didn't. He rehabbed, had surgery again, rehabbed, and came back his fifth year. And his fifth year had plenty of setbacks again. Started out at 157 pounds, placed at a Division I tournament at the University of Northern Iowa, beat some really quality Division I wrestlers. And a few days later, we had a uh, dual meet at Simpson College, and the weight loss to make 157 was just too much. And so we pulled him, he pulled off of 157, and we moved up. In January, that was in December, and then in January then, he became our starting 174 pounder. So he went from 157 to 174. And he lost quite a few matches because of the weight jump. He went into the conference tournament that year, seated fifth at the conference. First round, he beat a kid that had beat him earlier in the year, the number four seed. Second round, he beats the number one seeded tournament, the number one seeded wrestler in the tournament who was nationally ranked, and he beats a nationally ranked wrestler in the finals to win the conference tournament and qualify for the NCAA championships. He was an Iowa Conference champ, Scholar All-American, and uh, NCAA national tournament qualifier. And Paul, the question I have for you is how? How did you stay so focused through all of that? Many of us would have given it up. Well, thanks for the invitation back. I'm really happy to be here, and I have a bunch of family members and my wife and uh, uh, daughter up there, too, so um, we're excited to be back. But uh, I think for me, a lot of that had to do with goals, and I, I know that's kind of a generic answer, but um, my ultimate long-term goal was always to be a national champion. And, um, you know, I always wanted to perform at a high level, but, but ultimately I want to be a national champ. And so um, everything I did kind of revolved around that. Um, and so after each injury, I kind of had a uh, powwow with, uh, you know, Mitch, uh, Coach Mitchell and O'Gara and my family and uh, the people that were important to me, my teammates. And uh, I decided, you know, is this still my goal? Do I still want to be a national champion? Is it possible? And both times uh, it was, and so I met with the doctors and the physical therapists, and uh, again thought, you know, figured out the rehab it was going to be possible. Um, and so uh, you know, the second time decided to come back for the fifth year, um, and uh, and so uh, you know, once both times, once I decided that my goal was to still to be a national champion, then um, it was just about adjusting the short and medium goals, and. Um, you know, with the help of you know therapists and athletic trainers here at Luther um, and uh, teammates, et cetera, um, I, I was able to come back and perform at a really high level, and I was really happy about the way that things turned out. So, um, yeah, it was a, a good experience, and um, you know, I, I've taken it forward to, to other parts of my career. Yeah, can you share about that? So then, in medical school afterwards, and now as a sports medicine doctor, can you share a little bit about that? Yep. Um, so I think uh, definitely goal setting. I took forward to, I went to medical school at Iowa, and um, I, you know, I, the things that I learned here I definitely took with me, um, but one thing about uh, medical school is when you're at Luther, you're, you guys, everyone up there, you're taking uh, math and biology and paideia. We still have paideia? Yes, yeah, okay. <laughs> yes we do. Uh, so you're taking all these classes, and you're doing two-a-days and cutting weight and, um, you know, maybe recovering from injury, and so... That's a lot to, to handle for an 18 to 21 year old. Um, so by the time you get to medical school and can just focus on school, um, it's I was very confident that I could have success uh, after going through the my time at uh, academic institution like Luther. 
Um, and then kind of the, the last piece is about my, my job as a sports medicine doctor. Um, uh, I think that I can relate to my patients a little better, um, knowing that you know I've been through this and I understand the return to play isn't always just six weeks. We're gonna look at your schedule and figure out what, what's important to you. Um, but then the second part is, I, I definitely understand from a firsthand experience that there's a lot of psych, uh, psychological issues that go on with injury. And so it's not just an ACL or a fracture, but um, you know, you, you're not with your friends anymore. You're not you know, practicing and getting that runner's high kinda. And so that changes a lot about you and there's a period of depression. And so I think understanding that as a doctor um, uh, helps me treat the whole person, not just the, the knee or the whatever the injury is. And so, um, you know, I, I'm very thankful uh, for my time here at Luther and uh, uh, my relationship with Coach Mitchell because, I, I re you know, it's, it's set me up for success later in life. And, uh, uh, we're, again, just happy to be back and be part of this. So thank you. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Dan Marlowe. Dan serves as the assistant director of Luther College Career Center, and he's also a former Luther College student athlete and over, has over 20 years of coaching experience. Dan, you've got the opportunity now to work with Luther students in career services and uh, interact with employers and graduate schools. And what skills do you hear that employers are looking for? What are graduate schools looking for in, in the skill sets? Well, there. first of all, thanks for having me up here, Dave. You bet. Um, Thank you, Dan. Uh, one of the things that, that's out there that um, kind of shows and highlights the skills that employers want is what's called the professional competencies from NACE, which is the National Association of Colleges and Employers. Okay, so this is a group of kind of career folks like myself and human resources people from businesses get together to talk about, um, you know, just how we can make uh, the connection between school and whatever's next for students a little bit more efficient. And they came up with about eight competencies, all right, that are pretty much universal for just about any work situation. And one of the neat things is pretty much all eight of those competencies are very similar to what we're doing right here as a liberal arts institution, okay? So not only athletics. I just wanted to mention about four of them that I think that uh, employers are really excited about, all right? And student athletes are learning from their participation in sport, okay? So the first one is just communication skills and to articulate thoughts and express ideas effectively using oral, written, and nonverbal communication skills to instruct, inform, and persuade, as well as listening for meaning to gain understanding. The ability to deliver information in person and writing in the digital world. Now, maybe not as much with the written communication skills, but uh, definitely in the verbal and nonverbal communication that goes on in sport, in teams, athletes, when they sit back and realize it, are, are getting great training in that. And when they move on to whatever's next, maybe it's a graduate school, maybe it's a workplace, all right? If they reflect, they're gonna start to understand that there's a very similar set of communication taking place with their kind of work team as there was with their athletics team, okay? So we gotta really work hard as coaches to help our athletes understand that. And those same communication skills, I think are taking place in the classroom uh, all across campus with different organizations, all right? So, so we, we, we have to help our students really realize that, that that's a very transferable skill, okay? Second one, teamwork and collaboration, okay? So we get in sports, we have teams, we've got all types of that type of work going on very much related to communication. So these organizations are coming in and they want our students to be able to highlight their ability to be part of a team and to collaborate with others. So that involves building and maintaining relationships to work effectively with others in a team setting through shared responsibility, empathy, and respect. Seek and appreciate the viewpoints of those coming from diverse cultures, races, ages, genders, religions, and lifestyles, okay? And we're in a world, and I think Luther's, uh, you know, we're kind of working through this right now. You can't work in a silo, okay? So you've not only got your team, but your team has to work with other teams in the organization. So it's not only communication within your team, it's your team communicating with other teams. And sport can give you a chance to work on those types of skills and collaboration that's necessary to move any organization uh, forward. So um, uh, hopefully, again, we can, we can help our athletes and help our students understand that they've, they're getting those skills. 
leadership, okay, motivate, organize, delegate work by leveraging the strengths of individuals, the ability to use empathetic skills and a positive attitude to guide and influence others while reaching a shared goal through adaptability and effective uh, decision making. So sport can give an opportunity for young leaders to kind of try on those leadership roles in a context in which they're a little bit more comfortable and kind of see how it goes, see how to, to, to lead others and inspire others to be their best, how to lead an organization forward. And we don't, you know, I think that's something that we do really well here at Luther College, not just in sports, but in other areas as well. And we, we got to keep encouraging our young, young folks to, to take on those leadership roles because they become very important as they, as they transition in that workplace. Um, like I said, there's, there's eight of them. Uh, there was three right there, communication, teamwork, collaboration. The fourth one is maybe uh, one of the ones where I think sport has the most influence, and that's professionalism and productivity, all right? And probably also gets to Dave's, the heart of Dave's talk about resiliency. And in the definition that they've got right here, demonstrate integrity, integrity resilience, accountability, and ethical behavior. Okay, as Dave mentioned, workplace resilience, very, very important. Um, and athletes, just by the nature of doing what you're doing, you're going to have setbacks. Heard Paul's stories, we got, it's, if, if you're going to be an athlete, you're going to have setbacks. So learn how to be resilient from those things and push forward. There's also a lot of other things I hear specifically from employers when they come to our campus to recruit our students. And you know, they're excited when they hear uh, athletes, they want to talk to athletes because they know athletes have to do a great job of time management. Because if you are going to train not only in your season, but then also train outside your season, putting in 15, 20 hours a week, maybe have a work study job, um, also uh, uh, do the work in the classroom. Those are great chances to prepare. And like Paul talked about getting ready for medical school, you know, there's a lot of things going on with that. Uh, another big thing I hear from employers is athletes' ability to handle feedback. Because some of our, some students when they go out and they get in those early employment situations and they have an employer talk to them, you know, you need to adjust this, you need to work on that, you need to work on that. It's very hard for them to accept that. But as an athlete, you're used to it, okay? You've had a, you've had a coach uh, hold you to a high standard and um, uh, you're trying to meet that standard, you know it's not personal, you're trying to make yourself better and the team better. Um, so those are just a few things that employers are excited about uh, when it comes to athletes. Again, like Dave said early on, I think we have a lot of things going on, on this campus that, that train all those things. And I'm very excited that we've got um, uh, educators in our classroom that are actually taking some of these professional skills and in, in, in helping their students reflect on, okay, when we did this thing in Paideia, all right, you know, what, what, how did we, how, how are we communicating? How did we problem solve? So, so taking some of those things to, to start to pull that out. Um, our job as educators is to help students, all right, a lot of educators in the room tonight, we got to help students see these connections, see these things that they are doing every day that they probably don't even know they're doing. All right, and maybe bring them to the forefront of their mind a little bit more so that when it comes to them to take the next step to either graduate school or an employer or whatever's next, that they can bring those forward to show that they've reflected on those things. So long-winded answer to a short question. It was great. No, that's great. That's really great stuff, Dan. Thanks. There might be more questions for you later. Uh, Brian Nickel, pass it off to him. Nice hat, Brian. Yeah, thanks, Dave. You're I don't want to blind the crowd with my Every, yeah. head. So. Brian's in his sixth year as head baseball coach at Luther College and 10th year of coaching overall. Brian's helped lead teams to the NCAA Division II and Division III National Tournament. Brian, you've had great success as a baseball coach, and uh, baseball is an interesting sport, right, that you can only be successful a third of the time, and that's considered good, right? I mean, you get a hit, and a third of the time, it's considered good. <laughs> Maybe not as good as you want to be. Right, yeah, that's right. right. But, and you also kind of hear this, you know, concept of baseball players going through, you know, slumps. What do you do to help players develop resilience and the ability to let go of past failures and attack future successes? Yeah, I think, um, you know, dealing with slumps, it is a part of baseball. A fortunate thing for me is I was in a slump my entire career starting from t-ball, so <laughs> I, I know how to deal with that. Um, gets you prepared to help kids. Um, yeah, yeah. But, but really, I think uh, routine, right? Routine is very, very important. Um, and, and we talk a lot about routine with our guys. Um, and I think mental routine is even more important. 
Uh, I listen to a podcast actually about a heart surgeon, and, and we make it apparent to our guys, the routine needs to start when you show up in the locker room. Um, the routine needs to start when you show up in the classroom. What are you doing? Um, so for us, it's when I go to my locker room, I'm going to put my phone in there, I'm going to shut my phone off because nothing that's going to happen on that phone is ever going to matter because I'm going to leave it in the locker room, I'm going to walk out to the field. Similar situation, anywhere you're going to go and do something important, how do you check yourself out to start to mentally get engaged in that? Now, you can't show up to the locker room, right, three hours before the game, full uniform, eye black on, sweating, ready to rock and roll. There's got to be a little bit of a buildup for it. Um, and when things aren't going good, are you going to believe in that routine and stay in that routine to give you some familiarity with what's going on, right? I'm not having success. How do I stay in this routine? Uh, we talk a little bit about, okay, um, seven seconds, right? Every pitch, there's roughly seven seconds, sometimes five, but we'll say seven tonight. So what am I going to do with those seven seconds of time, right? The umpire made a bad call. I swung and missed, whatever happened. Um, so we try to break it down a little bit of, okay, I have three seconds to flush what happened. I've got three seconds to figure out what I need to do next. I've got one second to say, let's, let's go attack now and let's go do it, right? Because the process needs to go away and I need to just go do what I need to do. Um, and that needs to be part of our seven-second routine all the time. The interesting thing with baseball being a team sport, similar to maybe wrestling is, when I'm in the batter's box, I'm the only guy essentially participating for my team maybe right now. I know there's guys on base and there's other things going on, but everything's going to fall on me to, to execute what I need to do. Um, if I'm playing shortstop and the ball gets hit at me and it goes between my legs, whether we're playing in front of five people or 50,000, they're all looking at you. And how you're going to handle those next seven seconds is very interesting. Um, and, and that's very, very interesting, I think, to watch. Um, you know, for me, it's, you know, be better than my bad. You're right. Today, my bad. Well, okay, if I'm playing shortstop and I boot a ground ball, of course it's my fault. All right? <laughs> Create some accountability with yourself without maybe reacting at all. Everyone knows it was your fault and you didn't try to do it. So have enough self-awareness and trust in your teammates through your process and through your mental routine and your routine that I don't need to do that. I don't need to show everyone that. I know I screwed up. We all know you screwed up. It's okay. Um, how do I move forward and how do I handle these next seven seconds to engage myself for the next play that's going to happen? Because another one might be coming very, very shortly. Um, and, and, and realizing opportunity. There's opportunity for another ground ball. There's opportunity for another pitch to come. Uh, the game might be over. Baseball, we're probably going to play again in 25 minutes. <laughs> right? And then again the next day. And then again in 25 minutes after that. We don't have to wait a week. Thank goodness. I'd go crazy in my office for a week. Mm -hmm. um, interesting thing about my career that, that I think relates to my coaching and some resilience in it. And, and the reason I look for opportunity is two weeks with my senior year and, and back up to high school, I probably wouldn't have graduated high school if it wasn't for baseball. I would have never went to college if it wasn't for a high school baseball coach saying, hey, use your talent to get you into a school, and, and, and now here I am working at a great institution like this, and, and I look back to, wow, what, a, what would I have done if I didn't have baseball um, to get me there? Well, two weeks left in my senior year, I broke my arm. I didn't get to play in our conference tournament. Um, we were the two seed going in, and, and I really didn't know what to do with my life for two weeks, and it was really, really interesting. Um, and, and I found myself, okay, I'm calling pitches in the conference tournament and, and helping other players, and that's probably where the coaching started with me. But realizing your opportunity in front of you, I think, is a great re resilience tactic to say, all right, now what's next? And that's, that's where we try to use our seven seconds is to say, you know, flush it. It's over. Figure out what I need to do next, a quick little goal. Hey, here's what I need to do with this next pitch, and let's go attack. That's great stuff, Brian. If I knew anything about baseball, I'd want to play for you, that's for sure. <laughs> it seemed great. Renee, let's start with you. You can use your, yeah, either microphone. Renee serves as uh, Luther's athletic director and is entering her 20th year? Is that 19th year, okay, as Luther's <laughs> head softball coach. She's been named the conference coach of the year five times and has led Luther to five appearances at the NCAA Division III National Championship Finals and finished as high as third in 2018. Renee, uh, in visiting with you, uh, you've got some great strategies. And uh, can you talk a little bit about how you help your players overcome self-doubt and develop resilience and the methods you use to do that? Um, you know, I, I know. I know. No I know. Microphone. No Is it working? You can use this one. There's video tape. Okay. All right. Um, you know, I, I truly believe that it is so difficult to tell someone that, but then to show them and to feel it. And especially with young women, but I think this with all athletes, is to be able to draw upon the experiences that you have in athletics and to take them into all facets of your life. And I think of stories. My, my top stories are not done in the four years that you're here at Luther. My, my top stories are text messages that I get from my former student athletes telling me how they've used the things here in their real life. 
I'm going to tell you my best story. And I didn't even think about this until I heard Paul start talking. And I'm like, I'm going to switch my, I'm going to switch my answer. Um, top story that I've ever had. Um, my, let's see, she was an All-American in 2012. Kelsey Kittleson was her name. She was a catcher. In 2009, she was on the team. She actually played with Miss, Ki Miss Hess back there. I know your last name is not Hess anymore. Still stolen base record right over there. Married to Mr. Merrick over here. Um, but Kelsey um, came in, recruited her from St. Ansgar, Iowa. She was a, she was nobody. I mean, she really was. She played for one little 1A high school, but she wanted to go to medical school. And she wanted to play softball. And she thought Luther was the best fit to give her both opportunities. Um, we get into a game her freshman year, and we're winning by a lot, and I'm going to let her hit. And I go to my lineup card because I'm going to put number 15 in, and the kids aren't even on the lineup card. Like, we didn't put her on. She wasn't going to get into a game her, her freshman year. Um, umpire let me put her in. She struck out, went back to the bench. This was a kid that had so much resiliency, but I didn't even know it at that time. Um, but I'm going to fast forward to eight years after that in her career. And she was in a postdoctoral interview. This was postdoctoral experience where she was now a podiatrist, and she had this opportunity to go study in like Nicaragua or something. And she was gonna, she wanted to get it paid for. So she was in this interview, and her interview question was, "How do you gain confidence when you go into surgery?" And she looked around the room and saw an umbrella in the corner of the room. I want to put the mic down now. And she put the umbrella down, and they said, you know, explain that to me a little bit more. And she said, I got to be honest. I can go, anything that I've studied, if I can go from the top moment of that experience, I know I can, I know I can do it. And I, when I go into surgery, I think about my team being down I think we were down 1-0 in Salem, Virginia, in the national tournament. We were playing Ohio Northern, and I got up, and I hit a two-run home run, and we won. And I gained confidence from that because I gained confidence in all my training that I had up to that moment to hit that home run. And that's how I go into surgery because I trust that all of my training to be successful in that surgery is going to come to that moment. So I think about that batting stance, and I think about that hit, and I think about the fact that I have trained for this moment to perform this successful surgery. And so I can go from not just one moment, but I can also go back. She said, I can go back from that Ohio Northern game. And I had struck out the first two times. And then I went up believing that I could do it because I had trained for that moment. You know, and the same thing with surgery. She said, I know post-surgery, I am not going to be successful in every single surgery. She is a podiatrist, so she's batting, she's batting a thousand, she says. Um, but uh, in terms of, of that, she said she also knows she can go back and reflect from things in her surgeries or in her training as a doctor. She goes, she goes back to softball all the time. Because just like we said, you know, in softball, you know, she batted like 410 her senior year. She failed 60% of the time she went up to the plate. And she said, in, in, in medicine, I can't fail ever in my mind, right? But I know I could, I could have hap had that happen. And when I do that, I go back to my softball experience and figure out how I'm going to recover from that, just like I do with everything else in life. And so thank you, Paul, for giving me the idea to tell the Kelsey Kittleson story. But, um, but is, that, is that okay? Okay. Okay. That's a great example of it right there, building confidence and uh, trust in your training. Christy Nimrod, let's uh, pass it down to her if we could. Christy has over 25 years of coaching experience at the high school level. She's coached teams to five Iowa high school state titles and has been named the Iowa State High School Cross Country Coach of the Year six times. She serves as a Decora Cross Country Coach and co-head coach of the Decora, Decora Girls Track and Field Program. Christy, cross country is such a tough sport. She's such a mental grind. Um, and requires such mental toughness throughout. She just told me she has 66 girls on the high school cross country team and it's typically in that 60, 70 range all the time. How do you get 60 to 70 high school girls that wanna do that hard work? It's impressive. 
Can you visit with us? I know a little insight, so I know how, but can you share with us a little bit about how you use kind of weekly goal settings and reviews and developing and keeping girls progressing? Well, it's always interesting. We have goals all year. We start preseason, talk about where we want to go, and we start with the team. What do we want to do as a team? But then it becomes, what am I going to do as an individual to help the team get to where we want to be? And the funny thing is, it's hardly ever on what the outcome is going to be as far as how many times we're going to win, what are we going to do. It's about what I can do for my teammates. Where can I go? Who can I pick up? What can I do to pat somebody on the back? And in doing that, they find out things about themselves. So we start, we have a meet on Saturday here at Luther. So tomorrow morning, they'll write their goals. I give a list of things, they write on it. We try to change those up depending on what's been going on. And then before the meet, we try to talk to them. If we're on a bus, we talk on the way to the meet. We talk about the goals that we read that they had written. We talk about how they're going to reach those goals. And on the way home, my first question is, so what did you think tonight? And sometimes I'm completely surprised. I go in thinking, OK, this is the way the conversation's going to go. And it doesn't necessarily go, well, it was awesome because I made this happen, or this didn't go the way I wanted. And it wasn't what I was thinking, but it's definitely something that they learn. So it's interesting for me to sit back, and I become a better coach because of what the kids do. And then I use what they have taught me to help somebody else get better also. So we are so fortunate, like you said, 66 girls running 5K. Uh, two thirds will tell you that they don't like to run. <laughs> One third will say, I really love it and I really want to get better, but two thirds want to be there because of what they do for each other. And that's the teamwork that we do in everything. All of our jobs are working together for a common goal. And they're learning it at a really young age and doing it at a really high level. And I just want to correct, I've only been state coach five times, not five six times. Five times? Yeah. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. So far, so far. Thanks. Adam Riley, let's pass it on over to Adam here. Adam's in his 14th year, maybe, I don't know, maybe I got the years wrong, associate principal <laughs> and activities director at Decor High School. Believe it or not, your math is good. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Mathematician, not an arithmetician. There's a difference. You, you got a mathematical <laughs> tool belt there underneath your coat too, or? That's right. Uh, Adam also served, uh, served this past year as Decor's head baseball coach and uh, is an assistant coach with the football team. You're in a unique role, Adam, in that you get to work not only with uh, students in your role as a principal and athletic director, you get to work with coaches, and you get to work with parents uh, on the backside. Can you first of all share a little statistics that I know you oftentimes share at the high school with regard to participation in sport and the impact on performance in school? Yeah. You know, just like anybody else, whether it's at the collegiate level or anything else, you, you want kids to have the opportunity to participate. And I think probably our biggest recruiting tool to get kids to take the chance to participate in cross country, and even though they know they don't want to run that 5K, um, <laughs> is, is we have to do things to, to try to really sell what are they going to get out of it and what's the ultimate gain. And, and we really work hard. It's, it's well known. You, if you can find me a study that shows otherwise, kids participating in high school activities and interscholastic educational-based activities are gonna perform better in the classroom. Um, and, and we know that, and everywhere it is, so you've gotta be able to get them, get them there to be able to have the opportunity to be able to, to, to do that work and, and for them to start learning more about themselves through that process. So we work really hard to be able to, to, to sell that point. Um, no matter how many activities that you are in, your GPA is higher. Even if you're a six, uh, six activity person, whether it's four sports and two fine arts, um, it, it's, it's hard on the body and hard on the mind and, and everything else when it comes to that, but they do perform better in the classroom. Um, and, you know, as it ties back to some of that, we know there's some resiliency things that are going to come about from that because, as you alluded to, the teamwork side of things, um, managing time, those are, are, are two big things as well as their GPA to really get them to participate as much as we can. Okay. So something that's been on my mind lately, Adam, and uh, I'm sure you're seeing it. You've got a, quite a long career here now, but talk a little bit about, you know, what impact are our parents having on the ability of coaches and teachers to help students develop resilience? And, and uh, you know, we've heard this phrase, 
helicopter parent. There's a new one out there now that's called bulldozer parent that suggests you're bulldozing away for your children. You know, I, you know are you seeing differences or what are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, you know, when, when you see so many of the different articles and you hear some of the stories and, and some of the things that can center from the negative side of things, you know, I try to take a little bit of a step back. I'm an old social studies guy and loved my psychology and my sociology classes and everything else. And, and I, you know, when I really look at it a lot, of, a lot of different ways, the role of parents is changing. And through the history of time, there's always been societal shifts as far as what roles people play you know, over a period of time, and, and values are still always there and they exist. Um, I think who has to deliver those values or who's expected in society at times to deliver those values, I think that's probably shifted as much as anything. Um, and, and for various reasons, whether it's the modern working family or whatever it may be, it, it still really comes down to those shifts as they happen and occur. And one thing that I know a lot of our coaches do a really good job, and it's something that's always been instilled in my mind, and people like Christy do a great job, is you have to have a relationship with somebody and you have to work to develop that relationship to earn the respect and earn the trust from them. Um, and, and that's a huge part of when we're trying to take some steps to be able to work with parents, with students, you've got to find a way to develop that relationship. Now, it's a, it's a two-way street to develop that, and some parents are never going to allow you to develop a relationship with them for whatever reason, whatever, it, whatever it may be um, when it comes to that. But the more you're able to do with that uh, and, and to make decisions with that. You know, Christy talks about, you know, spending the whole bus ride to and from a cross-country meet trying to find a way, and we've talked about it before, to get to 60 to 70 girls. So every day that she has a conversation and or an assistant coach has with that, what's the bottom line? Well, that kid loves to be there because they've got a relationship with somebody, and that would be an adult. And parents are no different, uh, where you've got to be able to find ways to be able to get out and do some things. You know, um, my brother's a commander in the Navy. Um, he's in charge of a, a E2 squadron, and I've been lucky enough to spend a lot of time with him uh, multiple times when he's working. And he's been very successful in a lot of different ways, and I always view the military as it's this highly structured environment. There's no opportunity to break outside the mold of what's supposed to be happening and occurring because there's very serious business. But when I sit back and I watch him, and I, you know, he's got 150-some individuals that he's responsible for in his squadron, Everything's structured, but he spends his whole time, they all have jobs and responsibilities, getting out and going and developing a relationship with them because he knows they'll put more pride in what they're doing if that relationship exists. And I think it really translates to the work that we do as educators where if we're out there and trying to get to know some people and take some time for that, it, it helps in the long run. Great. We've got a little time left here. I uh, just want to open it up. Are there any questions? This is a great group of uh, experts that we have. Are there any questions that anybody has for any of the six panelists or myself? Okay, no problem. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, Sage? Uh, a question for Paul. Yep. Who are, your, who are some of your other goals besides the national champion? Like, compare yourself to your own weight cutting and everything, getting back into wrestling and recovering from injury. Yeah, um, yeah, overall goal was always to be a national champion, but um, it was about performing at a high level and making the team better, too. And that's one thing I kind of, when I was sitting here thinking about it, um, you know, we talk, um, or I talked about individual goals here, but um, if you, uh, one important aspect I think is thinking about the team and making the team better. Uh, and so just doing whatever you can to make the team better, uh, I, I think is an important goal too. So to use Kelsey as an example, um, the podiatrist, you know, she's in surgery, but she's not the only one in the room. She's in there with techs and, um, you know, assistants and nurses. And so um, if, if she struggles a little bit, she's got other people to rely on. And so all those other guys around you there, I, you know, I think if, if, if your goal, um, uh, and uh, as Christy was saying too, involves the team, I think that that helps as well. It takes some pressure off your shoulders and, um, you know, uh, in addition to your own short, medium, and long-term goals, if you can, um, you know, work hard for the other people around you, uh, I think that's, and I had a lot of great teammates, Matt Pyle, um, uh, was, was uh, tried to get here tonight, but wasn't able to get here. Um, but, uh, um, you know, I think working for the people around you helps too. And that, you can take that to your career or school or um, whatever it is. And so that's, you know, I think one of the things that really helped me and drove me to continue to get better even when it was tough. That's great, great feedback. Any others? Yeah, Ben.
Um, I think work extremely hard in the classroom. Okay, so when we're talking to graduate schools right now, they are concerned about your GPA. They are concerned about uh, test scores, if that's something that's important in terms of the program that you're, that you're doing. So, so you've got to take care of those things first. But beyond that, you can separate yourself in other ways. And one thing is your, is your athletic uh, participation, but specifically within that is to try and be a leader. And they're always looking for leadership skills, okay? And then I would also try to find uh, learning experiences outside the classroom. So when summer comes around, what is a learning experience that you could have that's related to that graduate school? So that's where the internships or research, kind of dependent on what you are interested in, having that other, other piece uh, that is connecting your classroom work outside the classroom to that future goal. So you get those three things together, tests, you know, scores and things like that, leadership skills and leadership experiences, and then that applied learning, uh, and you'll be good to go. Yeah. I'm just going to add to that, um, to, to what Dan said, taking care of things first. I also would think, and I do a lot of hiring of coaches and assistant coaches, and I would say that on paper, you have to get, you have to be qualified on paper, right? Like you have to have the GPA, you have to have the courses, you have to have the major. But that interview, that in-person experience is gonna get you wherever you wanna go. So I always think about when I hire, or you know, when you're talking about graduate school, does that hiring committee or does that graduate school selection committee wanna spend more time with you or less time with you after 30 minutes, right? So you're thinking about who are you and your personality and your drive and can you reflect that in 30 minutes? Because that's truly all you're gonna have most of the time because first impressions are so huge. And so thinking about how you portray yourself every single day, whether you're sitting in the front three rows of the class or the back three rows of the class, right? Because you wanna be making eye contact with that professor because you know what? Someday that professor is gonna write you a recommendation or not write you a recommendation. And the same thing with your coaches, because to be honest, I get a lot of phone calls, right? I get a lot of phone calls from people, from my former athletes who are, should I hire this kid? You know, or should I, should I allow this person into my graduate school? And a lot of times it is so easy to say, do you want to spend more time with this person? And most of the time they say yes. You know, and so thinking about that and that 30 minutes and that first impression, whether it be in a job interview or a graduate school interview, it's really going to be about those people skills that you have learned in athletics to portray that team player mindset and your drive. So, I think rigorous uh, graduate schools, too, are, are also looking at resilience. They know it's going to be a challenge. So our oldest daughter is at uh, dental school in Iowa, and there's only 80 they let in each year, and they want all 80 to make it. So they want resilient. They know those kids are going to be challenged and that they have to be resilient to stick with it throughout. Yeah. I'm going to start just a little bit, and if I can, and then I'll pass yeah. it off to you. And uh, Coach Aguera is over here in the back, and he, you know, he and I talk a lot about this. But <laughs> Coach Aguera, there he is, yeah. <laughs> but, and I, I bet <laughs> <laughs> Coach Nick will probably address the same thing. But we all have multiple voices, don't we, in our heads? There's voices of self-doubt that are you can't make them go away. You can control them but you, you won't be able to make them go away. There's always voices, am I able to do this? I'm not sure I'm ready for this. Can I handle this? All those types of things are gonna, and they're gonna come in hundreds, thousands of times as you're getting close to crucial moments of where you're looking for peak performance, no matter what it is. But with training, you can also train the other voice to quickly redirect the thoughts. And there's different ways of doing it, and Coach Nickel can share some. But uh, 
for me or with our guys, and I've talked a lot about it with some of our, our uh, upperclassmen right now because I think they've done the work. I think they're good enough to be great. But I want them to develop the positive self-talk that it takes when the going gets tough. And I've been listening to a podcast of a book um, by David Goggins. He's kind of a former Navy SEAL, and he's a crazy 100-mile runner. And um, he talks about having the answers to the question why before it occurs. So when you're in a, a tough situation, the question why is going to come up, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? Okay? Everybody has that question. No matter what it is that we're why am I doing To have those answers prepared before the why ever occurs, to know why you're doing it, and then have that positive soft talk. But what it is for me is going to be different than it is for you. And that's where building off those strengths and having a, you can't, you can't trick yourself. You can't uh, tell you something that isn't, isn't true, but you, 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 you have that positive statement. And usually for our guys, at least, it's a pretty short statement, something short that you can run through your mind hundreds of times, thousands of times a day. But when you go to bed, when you wake up in the morning, when you're walking across campus, that positive replaces this voice. It doesn't make it go away. It redirects it and takes control over it. Sorry. Yeah, I think, I think Dave's got some really good points. And I think it's understanding the power of the mind. Um, someone I know who's uh, know really, really well, <clears throat> when they were younger, they grew up um, on a farm. And uh, I think 10 siblings, uh, anyways, had a really bad stutter. And when he was six or seven years old, um, his mom, uh, he needed to get his tonsils out. Maybe he was eight, somewhere in there, and really bad. And, and then there was no speech therapist to go see. So this, this guy is in his 60s now. Uh, anyways, his mom told him, we're taking you to the doctor, and he said, for what? And they said, they're going to go in your throat, and they're going to take your stutter out. He said, okay. Went into surgery, he came out, never stuttered again. He has his PhD, um, and, and is a very, very successful person. And his mom was smart enough to maybe just throw that out there. I don't know if she knew that that was going to be the result, but he knew when he came out, I had a cut in my throat, all this stuff, I had to recover, get the ice cream, and my stutter's gone. It's gone. Right? He believed it was gone, so it, it went away. Now, would that happen for everybody? Probably not. I don't know. Um, I don't want to try it, but we're getting a doctor over here. I don't know. But, um, but I, I think wow. routine right, can be created however you want. So for some of our guys, it's how are you going to enter the batter's box? What are you going to look at? Right? I'm going to look at my bat. I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to breathe. I'm going to exhale. Okay, that's flushing it. That's getting my mind back in, and now I'm going to engage in what I need to do, and then I'm going to go, go after it. So Dave talked about uh, a positive saying. Um, and, and I agree, the negative things are going to be there. And if there's not any negative words in your head, someone's going to be doubting you. They're always there. Uh, we encourage our guys to write something on the bill of their hat, right? So there you get to see me throw a hat on. But, right, I can look <laughs> at my hat. I make an error. I take my hat off. I look at it real quick. I see that one word. Uh, whatever it is, I'm put my hat back on. I'm going to breathe, and then I'm going to uh, go after it. So maybe it's a big test, right? I'm going to set this routine every day. I'm going to set my pencil down. I'm going to crack my knuckles. I'm going to take a breath, right? Quick second of meditation, and then I'm going to go do my test or, or before I study. Um, but I think having those things set um, in stone can help you be prepared. So now your, your whole body is telling yourself, here's what I'm preparing to go do. Whether it goes good or bad, I'm going to feel prepared to, to go after that. But I, I do think that the, those mental routines can help you through anything you're about to, to go do, whether it be a, an event, a baseball game, or a test, um, or, or whatever it is. But to have something set that you're going to go do to prepare yourself. And then at the end of it, not what it is, what it is, but it's going to end how it's going to end. And, and if you feel prepared for it, at least you know at the end of it, I, I went after this with everything I had. I think another important thing in that is you need to talk to yourself the way that you would talk to your friend. So if those conversations going on in your head is not something you would say to somebody else, you need to stop. Mm -hmm. And we have a great person who works with our kids on the mental end. And one of her things is you need to have a word or a phrase that changes it. So for her, it's palm trees. Things aren't going right, she says palm trees, and she's able to switch it over. So it's important that you only get one thought at a time, and you get to control the thought. Nobody else does. Your parents can talk to you, your teachers can talk to you, your coaches can talk to you, and they can try to convince you to do it, but it comes down to you being able to do it day in and day out, and it's not easy. And it's something that has to be practiced. It's not going to, in the middle of a test when things are going bad, you can't just snap and say, okay, palm trees, now I'm better, I'm going to go. It's something that's practiced daily. Every time something gets tough, talk to yourself and figure out what you can do to make yourself a better person. People will help you, but it comes down to you. Yeah, that's right. It's funny that Adam's word is pina colada. It's funny you've mentioned palm trees. <laughs> pina colada. <laughs> That's just code. I'm really not telling that's you what right. it is. I heard it. I can see it. Yeah, that's right. Steve, question. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I agree 100%. That goes that that fourth point of the the professional competencies of productivity and professionalism. And you're going to be there. You're you know you're going to get done what you need to get done. Uh, you have goals. You're going to work towards organizational goals. And and as an athlete, that's part of what you do. And so it's it's very natural. And, and I think again to today's point earlier, it doesn't mean that. We don't have other activities going on on campus where, where, where those things aren't being reinforced. They are, but, but definitely in, in athletics. So good point. That's great. Well, uh, there's a social going on afterwards here, reception, so please stay around afterwards. Let's give our uh, panelists a big round of applause. Great to have them here. I appreciate them coming back. Awesome. Thank you.